All right. So, welcome to this lecture series on practical functional programming in F Sharp. Um, this is part. This lecture series is a part of um, of a course in functional programming given at the informatics department at the University of Tromsø. And you can find all the lecture material, all the links, all the resources, everything um, I will put on my GitHub page. So you go to github.com, uselius slash inf dash 3910 dash five, and there you will find any, anything I refer to, any links, books, videos, resources you will find there. So before we get started with uh, this functional programming business, um, Oh, I should mention, I, with me today in the studio, I have my psychic sidekick uh, and colleague, uh, Radovan, who will uh, ever so often interrupt me with untimely and critical questions. Hello, that, everybody. That will be really hard to answer. It also makes it a little bit easier for me to lecture since I'm not talking to a wall, but I can actually pretend that there is an audience. Um, so, um, before we get started with this uh, lecture series and, and get into the nitty-gritty of functional programming and the details of it, I think it's useful to put a little bit of context around it. What is it that we are actually doing? Why are we interested in functional programming? What is the fuss about? And, um, and, and we can actually broaden our view a little bit and, and say, okay, programming. What is programming about? And we're all programmers and we all know how to program. And, and a kind of a simple definition of programming would be we have some real life problem and we want to map that onto some kind of abstraction that we call a programming language, which will then translate that into a form um, that the computer can understand so that it can deliver some kind of result or effect. To back to us, so it will do what we so it will understand our thoughts and and it will produce what we want. Now, uh, the key here is really the word mapping and abstraction. How do we map our ideas onto something that the computer can understand? And and if you if you only know one programming language, then you're gonna your your world is going to be very limited by how you think about problems. Everything you do, you want to be mapping onto that particular way of thinking. And that's going to be very restricting. We can, we can say, well, everybody knows about Turing completeness. And, and it actually turns out that it's almost harder to write a non-Turing complete programming language than it is to write a, a Turing complete programming language. So this is, this is it's not really a, at all about what we can do, this is all about how we do things and how we think about problems and how we, how we map them onto the computer. And, and if you're a C programmer, then your, your whole world will be pointers and memory references and whatever you do, you're going to be looking at those things. You might want to build some higher level abstractions in C, but the bottom line is you think about the world in terms of memory, computer memory and computer really steps that the computer is taking, which might be fine for your purposes. But it's very limiting to only be thinking about problems in that way. If you're a Fortran programmer, on the other hand, you will probably think about everything in terms of vectors and matrices and just want to turn everything around you into linear algebra. And if you're a Java programmer, well, then uh, then you, everything is a class and an object. And how about Python programmers? Well, they're sort of all over the place, really. Uh, so, so I'm looking at the broad classes of, of uh, ideas here and paradigms that we have. And actually we can take all the languages and put them into classes that we can call the programming paradigms. Uh, and we'll get to talk about more about those uh, in the next lecture. Now, if you're a Haskell programmer, everything around you will be a function. And if you're a Lisp programmer, well, then you are lucky because then there are no limits to what you can think. 
there's just a load of parentheses to deal with. And um, Wittgenstein said that the limits of my language is the limit of my world. And this is really what this is about. We need to learn more than just one language. We need to learn more than one programming paradigm. Because otherwise we are limited in how we tackle problems. And the whole point here is really to be kind of efficient. It's, it's not really about just expressing your problem. Because if you could, we could be writing basically just raw opcode directly to the processor. Back in the day, they programmed computers with cables and switches. And that's hugely inefficient. So what we're really interested in is, is a way of expressing ourselves efficiently with a sufficient amount of control. And, and that's the key here. We want to be able to write our programs with as few bugs as possible in as little code as, as possible while still maintaining flexibility and readability and extensibility of the thing. That, that, this is really the basics of it. And if you're a C++ programmer, you have a big problem because those get very, very long and complicated and, and there's a lot of syntax going on, as an example. Um, I have posted on, on the links uh, site, I have posted a video um, which I really like you all to see. It's about 10 minutes long and it's an implementation of the game of life in a programming language called APL. APL stands for A Programming Language. And Dijkstra said about that language that it's a bad idea carried out to perfection. Um, and you can watch the video in two ways. You can look at it and say, oh, this is the weirdest language I've ever seen in my entire life. You actually need a special keyboard that you can order on eBay in order to program in APL. It's that weird. Um, and you can be amazed and just about human imagination and uh, strangeness. But the other way to look at this, this programming uh, uh, video is to see how that programming language provides uh, a framework of thought which allows the guy doing this thing to actually come up with a very ingenious and very compact and beautiful algorithm for solving the, the game of life problem. And I don't think that anybody would have come up with that particular way of doing it if they had not had that particular paradigm um, and that particular language available. So it's really shaping how they do things. And that's the whole point. And that's why we want to learn functional programming, because it will help us look at the world in a in a different, different light. It doesn't matter which language you actually write code in. Uh, you can choose whatever you want. It helps if you have a language that supports your thinking. But once you know functional programming, or you know array-based programming, or you know uh, logic programming, you can do everything you want in C or Assembler, for, for, if you like. But you are implementing the abstraction level in that language. And a little bit in the spirit of Scott Blashing's uh, Galaxy Brain list, there's a, there's a, I recommend everybody to learn a set of languages over the years. You don't have to do this like very quickly, but there's a list of languages that everybody should know. And um, there's actually, actually two books to go with it. I have put the links also uh, on the website. One is Brute's, Bruce Tate's uh, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. It will go through seven kind of semi-popular languages and esoteric languages, but all bringing something new to the table. And there's a follow-up to it, which is called, um, I think it's called Seven More Languages in Seven Weeks, which is also great. So then if you don't do those things, you will in 14 weeks, you will have learned 14 languages and you're, you will have a much larger galaxy brain. But um, some of the languages I think that they are useful to learn is, it's very useful to learn uh, assembler. Because it tells you how, at what level the, really the, the processor is, is on a, at the higher level, is operating. So assembler is very useful. Not very useful for, for writing 
uh, succinct code, but uh, useful for understanding what the computer is doing. Um, C is absolutely essential thing to know. Uh, again, very closely coupled to assembler, but it takes the abstraction level to, to a manageable level. Um, Algo is from 1968 and it has ideas that are still not available in, in uh, many modern languages. Smalltalk. 80 is a language that many people seem to consider to be the original really correct right way of doing object orientation. It's not really object oriented in the sense that we will understand it today because this is all around actors and immutability which is an important concept. And Smalltalk is a fantastically beautiful language that uh, I think it's both practical and beautiful. And everybody should know it. Um, APL, of course. Or it's little cousin J, which doesn't require a special keyboard. It's cheaper to learn J, since you don't have to get the keyboard. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, my question was about APL, and I need a, <laughs> whether I can do that without the keyboard. Yeah, you can also do APL without the keyboard. Right? And maybe another question would be, uh, well, you mentioned that Algo has something that modern languages don't have. Do you remember what that was? So nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have it in my mind right yeah. exactly, but there, there's a whole bunch of stuff in mm -hmm. Algo that it was a, really a, uh, advanced language for the time, and still is. And, and it sort of introduces modularity and, and uh, mm -hmm. procedures uh, in a way that was really ahead of its time. Um, prologue, which is logic programming or relational programming. I will talk a little bit later about prologue, uh, but this is, this is fantastic stuff. Really, really impressive stuff. Java or whatever, Python, Java, C Sharp, I don't care, C++. But that's a, sort of a modern standard object oriented language. Very good stuff to know. And um, F Sharp, of course, which is the topic of this course. I don't recommend, this is for functional programming, a very good starting point. I don't recommend learning Haskell. Um, although Haskell is a fantastic programming language and one of my favorite languages, but it's, it's like drinking from a waterfall. Uh, there's so much going on with Haskell and you so quickly get suckered into super, super, super advanced type theory and stuff that is completely irrelevant really for, uh, for the actual programming aspect of it. But you meant to not recommend learning Haskell as the first function program? No, no, not as the first. Yeah, uh, I eventually, yes. absolutely recommend learning Haskell and PureScript and enjoy those languages mm -hmm. immensely. But as the first one, there's too much going on, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, and of course, everybody should know some Lisp. That's, that's a sort of an essential thing. Um, and finally, there's something called stack-based programming or concatenative programming. And the, the really the state of uh, the default programming language, there is something called fourth. But I think for fun of it, you should try to learn to program in PostScript, which is the basis of PDF. And that's a Turing complete stack-based programming language. And I always think that if I ever get thrown in jail, uh, it's good to know some PostScript because then I can write my uh, programs as PostScript programs and I can send them to print the printer and it will actually solve the computational problems for me and print out the answer. So then at least you're, if you're allowed to, to write letters to your, to your lawyer, then you can also do some programming. <laughs> so, um, finally, before we conclude uh, this session, this is a, a practical course, but it's also a, a master level course, which means that this is partly 
practical and partly theoretical. And, and these, these lecture series and these videos that I will publish, they will be mostly theoretical. And the practical aspects of this will happen during the colloquia and, and exercises. Um, but I will, I will do some introductory stuff to, to F sharp. But for anybody following the videos, um, I'm afraid there's not going to be a huge uh, load of F sharp tutorial stuff here. The agenda is also on GitHub, so you can look at that. We're going to go through a bit of lambda calculus. We're going to go through a little bit of type theory. We're going to go through, uh, spend a lot of time on abstractions, really. Um, and we're going to learn about stuff like functors and applicatives and monads, and, but in a, in a kind way, I hope. Yes? And how many lessons do you plan to uh, create and publish? Uh, officially, uh, there should be 15, uh, 15 lectures, but I will do shorter videos and, and put them and number them so that they go from 1 to X. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that the number of videos will far, far exceed 15. I think there's going to probably be end up like 30, 30 videos in this, in this lecture series. So that's all for now. Now it's lunch time, and uh, maybe I have time to do one more after after the lunch break. We'll see. Until later.